I met Audrey in a nursing home in early 2016. I'd been a hospice volunteer for a couple of months, and Audrey was one of my very first patients. She was confined to a hospital bed and had problems with her eyes, so she wore really large gold sunglasses. She called her bling glasses. And next to her bed was a giant cork board filled with all these photos of her in her teens and 20s. And there were pictures of her hanging out with Doris Day and Michael Landon. I love this board, and I could talk to her for hours about the stories behind the photos. For the better part of that year, we got together almost every week. I read to her. Sometimes we'd just sit quietly and listen to music. I got to know her kids, her grandkids, her great-grandkids. I felt like part of the family, and I so looked forward to those weekly visits with her. Then one day in October 2016, she said something that completely shocked me. Now, for those who may not remember or who have completely blocked it out, here in the United States, 2016 was an election year. <laughs> and was a little bit um, contentious. So it was against that backdrop that I sat holding my friend Audrey's hand, listening to her Frank Sinatra CD, when she turned to me and made this completely vulgar comment about one of the presidential candidates. And what she said devastated me. I hadn't heard her swear before, which was jarring in and of itself. But the person she was swearing about was the person I planned to vote for. It was my candidate. And what she said left no doubt whatsoever that she and I were on opposite sides of the political fence. And my head started spinning. Should I say something? And if I say something, will she hate me as much as she clearly hates my candidate? Should I hate her now? And how have I managed to become friends with someone who's supposed to be the enemy? But here's what I learned. And here's what I knew. Audrey wasn't the enemy. She was a friend, and she was someone I'd grown to love. And as I sat there, still holding her hand, I started to feel ashamed. And I felt ashamed because if I was honest with myself, if political affiliation had been part of her profile when I was asked to take her on as a patient, I most likely would have said, no. That election year brought out the worst in a lot of us. And everywhere I looked online, people were arguing with strangers, writing off friends and family, or too quick to use the unfriend button. And in that polarized environment, my own animosity and judgment of anyone who held opposing views was preventing me from forming relationships with people just like Audrey. And I didn't like feeling mad or bitter all the time, but in my head, what was at stake justified my outlook. As I thought about that afternoon with Audrey, I had an idea. What if I could somehow replicate that experience with strangers and learn to approach people from the other side of the fence with more understanding and compassion? And my idea was pretty simple. I would seek out strangers who held diametrically opposing views from my own and simply invite them to lunch. And I wanted to meet for lunch because from a practical perspective, it would give each of us something to do while the other person was talking. I mean, I was planning on meeting strangers after all. But lunch held more significant importance for me. There's a lot of symbolism around eating together, weekly family meals, breaking bread together, holiday feasts. I wanted to, if even in a symbolic way, tap into the sacredness of sharing a meal together. And I didn't want to put many restrictions on it, but I did think I should have a few ground rules. One, I decided that once a lunch was scheduled with someone, and this was much, much harder than you'd think, I wouldn't Google them. <laughs> I wanted to meet as strangers with no preconceived ideas. And two, lunch wasn't intended to be a debate, but rather a dialogue where we could just get to know one another, but without needing to shy away from our differences. And three, I wasn't looking to change anyone's mind, nor was I looking to have my mind changed. Once I had my idea pretty much fleshed out, all I had left to do was find people willing to meet with me. And to do that, I went straight to ground zero of the polarized partisan divide, Facebook. <laughs> I sat in front of my computer drafting what I wanted to say. My post would explain what I was trying to do, and asked my friends to forward my offer to people they knew who held views counter to my own. And once I had the wording down and made sure everything was spelled correctly and reread it probably 30 or 40 times, I deliberately and slowly hit the button and posted my proposal. I did it, there was no turning back now. I was slightly panicked until fairly quickly people started to respond. 
The unexpected thing was how liberating simply posting my idea online was. There was something powerful about calling a timeout in the midst of all the craziness and offering an olive branch. And I was really moved by the number of people that I rarely interacted with who took the time to comment or to reach out to me privately in response to my post. And then later that day, I got a friend request from someone I didn't know. And I was a little thrown by this request, I'll be honest, because we had no friends in common, and his profile picture didn't show his face, but only his tattooed arm. And let's just say it was more of a manifesto than a tattoo. <laughs> it made clear where he stood politically, and it wasn't on my side of the fence. But still, in the spirit of this new project of mine, I decided to accept his friend request. Moments later, I received a direct message from him where he started to tell me his story about how he arrived at his political views, some of which was painful and personal. And we didn't live near each other, so lunch wasn't an option, but he said, if ever you're in town, I would love to meet with you. And he ended his message by saying, I understand and appreciate what you're trying to do. Please keep up the good work. This small interaction was so moving to me. I didn't expect to feel a connection with this man, and it was clear what I had posted tapped into a sentiment shared across the board. And my first local connection and official lunch was with a man named Scott. And I arrived a little early and kind of anxiously waited until promptly at noon, Scott walked in and sat down. We exchanged a couple pleasantries, and then we just kind of jumped right in. And at first, I found myself seizing on everything he'd say and thinking, well, that's exactly why we can't be friends right there. <laughs> Damn it. But soon, my defenses dropped, and I just started to listen. There was something about the setup of these lunches that allowed us to ask about each other's opinions out of a genuine curiosity and not from a combative stance. It turns out Scott and I had a lot more in common than not. He had a sense of humor which mirrored mine. I learned he had a son and his wife was pregnant with their daughter due any day. I shared pictures of my kids. Scott and I worked in the same industry and knew a lot of the same people, so over lunch we swapped stories about what it was like to work in our industry and hold the views that we each have. And as he told me history, I gained real empathy for how challenging and difficult it must be for him to be truly authentic with people in our community, most of whom would assume he's of a different political party than he actually is. Now, I left that lunch feeling exhilarated, but I also left that lunch without changing my mind on a single issue. But I did gain a perspective I wouldn't have had otherwise. Having lunch with Scott allowed me to see him as a whole person and not the enemy. Since then, he and I have gotten together for lunch frequently, and I'm happy to call him a friend today. That initial lunch was the start of many meetings over many months. I had lunch with men and women. I met people with a range of differences on many issues. I met one man who said about 12 different offensive things in our very short time together. <laughs> and another who couldn't help pointing out flaws in my opinions every time I talked, which was challenging. But still, I had a willingness to listen, and not an ability to be neutral, and not an ability to prevent the occasional eye roll, <laughs> but simply a willingness to listen. And sometimes that came naturally, and other times I had to talk myself into it. But I still found the process of eating together valuable. It turns out that most of the lunches I had were fun, and I enjoyed getting to know them. But not everyone I went to lunch with became a friend. And one of those lunches was with Mark, who was referred to me by someone who'd seen my post. We met for lunch at a cool outdoor restaurant near a local college. We introduced ourselves and started with the very safe ter territory of what we did for work. I told him I sold real estate, and he told me he ran a marketing company serving politicians. But when he told me the name of the company, I instantly recognized it. His clients were what I would describe as fringe extremist politicians. I was totally blown away by this fact. I mean, if the other people I'd been meeting with were the opposition, this guy represented the opposition's command center. And here I was, <laughs> face to face with him. And my head started to spin as I thought about how this guy in front of me, as responsible for the marketing ads and talking points that I find most offensive, 
And at this point, I was sure he could see my face turning red, and my hands were sweating, and I was trying to keep them dry under the table, and then, <laughs> and then our salads arrived. <laughs> and I was pulled out of my head. This was exactly what I wanted. I was engaged in exactly what I had asked for, however messy it might be. This moment right here. So I forged ahead. And Mark was friendly, but conversation didn't flow naturally at all. We politely talked politics and raising kids. I learned he had two sons like I did. He said things that made me uncomfortable, and I'm sure I did the same to him. But in the end, we followed the guidelines, treated each other as people instead of sparring partners. We finished our lunch, thanked each other, and went on our separate ways. Now, I talked over that awkward lunch so much with friends over the next few days. I was sure Mark was equally happy to call that our first and last lunch together. <laughs> we disagreed on almost everything. But the way I figured it, at least we managed to connect over being dads to two boys. At least we had that in common, right? And then a very dear friend of mine said to me, you know, it's easy to love someone because of your similarities, but try loving them because of your differences. <laughs> what my friend said to me totally tweaked my perspective, and in a profound way. She was right, and I started to take that new perspective with me out into the world, and into my lunches in particular. I started to meet people on their own terms and stopped worrying about how they fit into my experience. And the way I interacted with people I had lunch with, turns out, was uniquely different than the way I interacted with people inside my own social circle. And even small, seemingly meaningless interactions with people from the other side of the fence, like the message I received from the tattoo after my post, could leave me feeling elated in a way I didn't necessarily feel with people inside my own echo chamber. Being afforded respect by people who deeply disagree with me feels pretty good. Simply acknowledging our differences without feeling the need to qualify them in any way seems to allow us space for a more genuine connection. And this project of mine may not change the world anytime soon. Hostility and rancor are alive and well in the United States and across the globe. And for me, this has been an evolving journey. I mean, sure, it's easy to have compassion and look past differences for an elderly woman on hospice care but it's been a little less easy for me to replicate this out in the world. But still, I have found this process has transformed my outlook. I'm less irritable and angry. And when visiting family, I haven't had to say that silent prayer. I'm sure a lot of you know. Please don't let them bring up politics. Please don't let them bring up politics. <laughs> my reactions to the news and stories online have become more subdued. And don't get me wrong, I still have very strong convictions and opinions, and frequently find myself agitated. But my responses to things haven't been as filled with adrenaline as they once were. And I wish I always felt this way, but I don't. But if all I get are small reprieves from the divisiveness, then it's all worth the effort. And maybe the people I've been meeting with have also experienced a shift in their perspective. Maybe not. But in the end, there was only one thing this project could have changed, and that was me. But going in, I thought this project would allow me to see the light in others. But instead, it's been about uncovering the light in me. This project is not for everyone. <laughs> there aren't a lot of people who want to have lunch with a stranger talking politics, especially one who completely disagrees with them. But we can all choose ways to move beyond our social circles, to choose discomfort in the very short term for a greater sense of peace in the long term. And if we all do that, maybe we can start to see the light in ourselves and each other. Thank you. <laughs>